X people of Reddit, what changed your views? Story one, not me, but my best friend's parents. They told her not to touch me because she would get my skin disease. I'm a brownie, and at the time we met, I was 12. They didn't want us to be friends, but I would always be kind and polite to them, full well knowing how they felt about my skin color. One year, my friend, at this point best friend, was having a sleepover birthday party and her parents said I could come, but couldn't sleep over. My friend canceled her party, and her parents must have felt like complete cow because they started to talk to me more and more after that. We have been best friends for almost 30 years now. Her parents came to my wedding. They send me a Christmas card every year. They call me and ask how I'm doing. And they invite me to their get-togethers. I'm glad they came around and I'm proud of them. Story 2. No matter how far through this thread I read, there seems to be one major pattern. My parents' family were... And then I spent time with people of other ethnicities. It really proves that prejudice is just fear of something you don't easily recognize. And once a person actually learns a bit about them, it's much easier for them to accept it. It's a shame that when some people come across new cultures or tradition, their initial reaction is to reject it as it's not the normal they know. Life really is just a big mix of shared experience. We don't have time to make judgments based on race. Story 3. My dad would make disparaging remarks about people, Mexicans, Chinese people, etc. When I was a kid, I remember repeating those same sentiments and no one ever corrected me. In first grade, we were all assigned pen pals from a school in another city, and mine was a girl named Chardonnay. I thought she had a weird name and I was disappointed when I found out she wasn't white. Very soon after that, we learned some very basic info about the civil rights movement during History Month. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, separate water fountains, segregated schools, stuff like that. After that, I felt really bad about being and wanting a different pen pal and really ashamed of my dad and grandparents for thinking that way. And I was so mad that they'd taught me to think that way. After that, I was really happy to have the opportunity to write to my pen pal and get to know her better. I'm so thankful that my school started teaching us about racism early on. It's scary to think how I could have ended up if those sentiments had gone unchecked. Story 4? Man, I don't even know where to start with this one. I grew up in the middle of flipping nowhere Mississippi, where the slave trade was referred to as the Great African Migration in our history books. Every person of color was referred to by the N-word as just the default. It wasn't until I moved the fudge out of the South that I began to comprehend what racism was. I wish I could say I had a moment of clarity that washed away all the nonsense that I'd grown up with, but it was more like a couple decades worth of mental deprogramming I had to fight against. There was so much underlying hate of different people that warped how my view of the world was. Story 5. I grew up in a white bubble. White neighborhood, white schools, white friends. I wasn't hate-filled or anything towards other, just a bit nervous due to zero experience. I heard a lot of racial epithets, but didn't say them myself. Going to college, I met many people of many different, and found most of them were good people. I discovered that the same 10% unpleasant person to 90% good people I found among white people at my high school translated to college as well. The assholes were not grouped in a particular minority, but pretty universally scattered. Mom was surprised when I brought home a girlfriend from college who wasn't white. Mom asked why I didn't tell her in advance, but I didn't think it was important. I married that girl a few years later. Story 6. I didn't realize I was and being raised in a household until fourth grade. I was in a group project having to give a presentation to the class. My group was me and two girls. My parents hated women. People in general, but especially women. As they both watched tennis, you can guess all the cow they said about the Williams sisters. Meanwhile, there I was standing there watching my group mates talk. They were just as good, if not better than me, at talking in the class, or understanding the material, or anything really. I can still see that moment where the class fades away in my mind, and a one of my group mates is talking to the class where I realize a fundamental truth. My parents were wrong. It still makes me sad thinking about stuff I remember saying as a kid, regurgitating things I heard my parents or relatives say. But in my experience, as I have gotten older, is that the hash one way to combat racism is to bring people into the same room. When people have shared experiences, that sense of otherness fades away. Of course, in 2021 and the internet bring what it is, it's really easy for people to hide in their own corners of the internet. But I'm thankful for that experience in fourth grade. I got in trouble a lot over the years for getting mad when family would throw around the eat N-word or lock their doors when they saw people. But I knew I was right. And in the decades that have passed, nothing has tarnished or taken away that childhood lesson. Story 7. Not me, but my grandpa told me that when he was young, he was a bit due to his a-hole alcoholic dad being really, and teaching him to treat others of different like trash. He told me this stopped, though, when he was around 13 when his dad left. He realized how stupid it was to judge others based on race, and I'm glad he realized how stupid it was since he's a really sweet guy now. Story 8. The army forced me to live with people.
Turns out I didn't hate anyone. I was just afraid of what I didn't understand and had some very stupid notions passed on to me from my dad and his friends. I will forever be grateful for the opportunity to understand a greater sample of people than my tiny hometown afforded me. Edit. Thank you all, kind strangers. Please no more awards, though. If possible, please consider donating instead to an organization working to deprogram extremism and hate, like Parents for Peace or Life After Hate. Story 9. As a lurker, this is a thread I can contribute to. From birth, I was raised to be in a household, VA. I was ignorant. I used the N-word, anti-Semitic, homophobic, language every day. My immediate family and extended family all share the same ignorance. At family gatherings, if one of my older cousins let slip they were dating someone new, the first question would be, is she white? Followed by laughter, but the question was serious. Then I started middle school, sixth grade. On the first day of class, I set down my backpack against the classroom wall, like every other student. While we found our desks and had a small meet-greet W new classmates, I made sure to only speak to the kids, white, whom I knew from elementary school. Our teacher told us to take our seats. I'm 42 years old and I remember this like it was yesterday. I picked up my backpack, found my desk. Before I could open my bag, the girl behind me told me she liked my earrings. Her mom wouldn't let her get her ears pierced until high school. Then I heard another voice from further behind me say, Miss K, this isn't my backpack. The backpack sitting on this girl's desk was identical to the one sitting next to my desk. We both opened our backpacks and realized we'd grabbed the wrong bag. Internally, I rolled my eyes in disgust. This girl was a... N, but I was taught to never let it show. So we met each other to quickly exchange. Her smile was beautiful. She wore glasses the same shape as mine. She wore her hair in a ponytail just like mine. In our back-to-school shopping, we picked the exact same backpack and we picked the exact same Nikes, pink-white. Her name was Jacinda. I found myself genuinely smiling back to her and giggling like young girls do. That day, she asked to sit together during lunch, and we sat beside each other for lunch every single day of middle school. She was my very first best friend. Jacinda taught me about her Sunday school classes. My family never attended church. We talked about everything important in the life of middle school. She wasn't allowed to attend my birthday parties, and I wasn't allowed to go to hers, but we always celebrated together at school. I loved her so much. When it was time to go to high school, I continued in public school, and her parents chose to homeschool her. I thought homeschooling was the coolest idea. Jacinda was, is brilliantly intelligent. God, she was going to do great things for this world. Long before the age of social media, we lost touch sadly, but I still think of her often. After meeting Jacinda, I never used another or derogatory word. Meeting Jacinda changed my life for the better. Edit. Thank you all so very much. Sharing my experience touched more hearts than I could ever imagine. I'm enjoying reading your replies and messages. I'd like to speak to a few common themes. Yes, my story is real. This is not a lie or fabrication for Reddit karma. Jacinda is a very real person. Her friendship forever changed my life for the better. The hash find just into comments have made me smile. Thank you. Thank you to Redditors who offered their support to help me locate her. Jacinda was a beautiful, special piece of my life and my heart. Like many of us experience, she may have been a more profound person in my life than I was in hers. And that's okay. To her, I may be a silly childhood friend she may may not remember. I shared my story not to find Jacinda or have a tearful reunion. I shared my experience as a personal truth that people can change. The narrative I was fed for the first 11, 12 years of my life was a lie. I learned, almost like a strike of lightning, there was unequivocally no difference between me and this young girl other than the color of our skin. I saw Jacinda as better than me in almost every way, more intelligent, more athletic, more extroverted, and she always treated me with love, kindness, and friendship. I was a young girl who was taught to hate simply for the color of another person's skin. Children are not born to hate others. They are taught to hate others. My Reddit account is newish, however. I've been a Redditor for many years. This is my third account. I deleted my previous two accounts with the thought of, I spend entirely too much time on this silly app, and this silly app draws me back in. I also like to share we're wholesome memes with my work team when they need a smile. Story 10. My dad was. I was raised in a toxic environment, and I guess some of his ideologies rubbed off on me. He was also violent when alcohol was involved, which was a lot of the time. Police would often arrest him to just get him in a cell for the night for being disorderly. On one occasion, the police turned up. One of them came into my room and sat with me as they dealt with my dad. He asked how I was, who I could talk to, etc. He was from a South Asian background. He was very kind to me and did his best in calming me down and giving me advice on dealing with this stuff. I was only about 15 at the time. As they were pulling my dad out, that same police officer was attacked by my dad after breaking free from another officer, breaking the officer's finger in the process, whilst also hurling verbal racial abuse at him. 
It wasn't long after the London bombing, so you can imagine what was said. My dad was also an electrician in Russell Square at the time, close to one of the blasts. The officer didn't react, probably knowing I was watching the commotion from my room or the fact he was a decent human being. My dad was convicted of multiple offenses against a police officer as well as a hate crime. The only silver lining was as my dad was being sentenced. The prosecutor was a man who casually read out the testimony of the arresting officer of what my dad said that night. The prosecutor could barely keep a straight face, watching my dad hold his head in shame, dressed in plastic overalls because he thought stuffing his clothes down the toilet of his jail cell and flooding the place would be funny. He got community service, probation, and was required to attend rehab. He relapsed a few years ago and can barely walk or talk because of multiple strokes from continued alcohol dependency. The people responsible for protecting me from my dad were people of color. That sure as hell changes your perspective on things, even if you have the slightest ignorance towards another race. Edit. Typo conclusion. Dad was a violent dressed in prison overalls, sentenced by educated guy in suit. Story 11. My situation was complicated growing up. My father was the son of an Italian immigrant with Egyptian roots, and he was so ungodly towards anyone not considered white as he considered himself white. The thing is, my dad has dark brown skin, dark brown eyes, and kinked curly hair. He looked exactly like the people he was against. And he hated Arabs, all Arabs, and he is part Arab. This was so confusing. He also hated boy people, Muslims, commies, and any type of alternative lifestyles. My father hated people the most. He told me if I ever brought home a boyfriend, he would disown me. He told me as a small child that if I misbehaved, I would be sent to live with a family in the ghetto. He was equally misogynist and held onto a strong patriarchal mindset. I admit, as a kid, I repeated his words. All the other kids did too on my neighborhood, so I thought he was right. It wasn't until I was literally in my 30s did I realize the internalized racism I still held on to. All my partners and friends were white my entire life. I felt unsafe near a group of men. It was only until I moved to Northern Europe that I realized that I am not considered white here and experienced racism myself, and oh wow, what an eye-opener. I began to dismantle my entire thought process, and honestly, I am so repulsed by my father now I can't even speak to him without feeling disgusting inside. He's really old now and much more calm and probably won't live more than 10 years. I have not returned to my birth country to see him in almost seven years because I'm so angry at him. Because of his racism, I missed out on friendships, relationships, and understanding cultures different from my own. I am making up for it now as the immigrant community that I live in is amazing and supportive. But I will never get back that lost time, and I will never know fully the extent of damage that my hateful words may have done to people who didn't deserve it. Story 12 I know this isn't the exact question, but I was raised in a strict military Republican household. Though my family wasn't racist, they were extremely and beloved women belong in the home and in their place. They would make fun of lesbians and boy men throughout my whole life. Speak poorly of women working outside the home. When I was 18, I met a guy at my local coffee shop in a very red town state. I couldn't decide if I wanted to date him or take him shopping and hang out. He was just super cool. We made plans and later ate hot wings and drank wine. I had never felt more myself than when I was with him. I had to forgot any financial adult backing in college because my new lifestyle didn't meet my family's ideas. This was absolutely okay with me, and I charged through challenge happily while accumulating debt. Turns out he ran away from his home and was off from his family for being boy. He became my roommate for more than nine years and my best friend in the world. And my roommate, I mean I always had a place for him to stay in my own home and he always seemed to move right in in the most natural way possible. Literally, he just was always there in my home through every stage of life for a decade. He introduced me to the boy community, and as a female, instead of getting harassed at a club, I could go out dancing with him and have a blast and be safe all night. He became my family and closest confidant over the years. My family didn't take kindly to this friendship, nor did they like that I became a business owner. They no longer speak to me, and I am so happy to be the sheep. Anyway, I'm so, so, so glad I met him, and he changed my life. I would have been comfortable in my conservative bubble and probably never questioned my views. His friendship made me open my eyes to not only the world of possibilities, but also my own views of what I was raised with. He challenged me and made me a better person. And I'll always be grateful for the absolute gift he gave me. Because I was now a safe person with views different than what my small town was used to, I became a safe friend for people to come out to. And my God, it's been the honor of my life to grow, find acceptance, and apply acceptance blindly. Story 13. My great aunt and I had a conversation before she passed away. She lived her whole life in New Zealand and admitted to me that she was against the indigenous people of New Zealand. Way back in the day, her and her husband bought a house on what they didn't realize was Maori sacred land. 
They were the first people on the street, but it was eventually filled up. Over the years, they had lots of run-ins with the elders and even protesters. This tension only worsened her ideas of Maori people. Her and I are both spiritual religious people and had already talked about our respective beliefs a bit. She said that one day the Holy Spirit told her to learn the Maori language. She said she resisted the thought for a long time, but eventually decided to. Learning the language connected her with Maori culture, and more importantly, directly with Maori people. She learned to love their culture and continued going to lessons for the remainder of her life. They also demolished their house and built a new house down the road. So if you're ever in New Zealand and find a street where the house numbered one is planted firmly between three and four, you found the house of my family. Too stubborn to change their house number, but willing enough to knock over their old one for people they didn't know. Story 14. My first name is one of the top five female African-American names in the U.S. I'm whiter than the Little Mermaid. Everyone always thought it was funny that I was a white girl with a girl's name, and I just rolled with it. It wasn't a big deal. I mean, it was, but it wasn't. I would throw around causally stuff all the time because I thought I could. I never understood what people meant when they were talking about when the term institutional racism until I got out of the army and started sending resumes in. I never got callbacks, so I decided to start taking my resume into places in person instead of doing the online application that's so prevalent nowadays. And for every resume that I dropped off in person, I always got a call for an interview. If I applied online to the same place with the same resume but a different phone number, I never got called back. If I sent the same resume to the same place using my first initial and last name, I got a call back. This real and it's so damaging and demoralizing. Story 15. My abuser, who I lived with ages 6, 14, was very... I never hated people or had any mean thoughts, but I would still avoid them subconsciously on the street when walking the same way and didn't have any or POC friends. Mind you, the school I went to was very white and privileged. At 15, I was able to escape my abuser and go live with my father in a lower class and very diverse neighborhood. Over the years, I just realized my own habits and misguided feelings on POC and people. The one specific thing that stands out as a boy was harassing me in art class. Kept mentioning my balls as I was a very busty 15-year-old. He was also flipping with a girl at our table wearing a hijab, teasing her more and more aggressively. She looked at me. I looked at her, and we both got up and went to the pencil sharpener, and she said, I should go to the principal and report him. I said I was too scared, and she said she'd come with me. I told her she should report him too, but she said they wouldn't care about him being. We went to the principal's office and stayed with each other while we both wrote up reports and spoke to the vice principal about it. Story 16. I grew up in a very small town in Iowa. Couple of hundred people, all white. So I guess I was raised not to discriminate against people that were different from me because we were all the same. Once I got older and moved to the city, oh yeah, racism is alive and well in Iowa. I didn't fall into that trap. I didn't understand it. Ended up in Alabama. My best friend was. We just had the same sense of humor and liked the same things. I credit him with my kids being non. He would crack jokes about racial things and they would be shocked. As they got older, they just rolled their eyes. Funniest thing was one of my daughter's date shows up and he opens the door and introduced himself as her dad. He moved to Michigan. I miss Charles. Story 17. My dad weighs is pretty and I was just raised in that environment, so I was too. An example I remember is being so excited to show him the first CD I ever bought, Gorilla's first album, and his reaction was, so you like N-word censored music? The main catalyst, however, was him excitedly calling me into his room one night and wanting to show me a scene in a movie he was watching. That scene was the curb stomp from American History X. I was probably 8, 10. Seeing his absolute glee at the flipping barbaric murder of the people in the movie and praise on Edward Norton's Nazi character really shook me and the idea that he thought I'd share in his delight. I walked out of the room in kind of a daze, and that's the moment I realized that wasn't the kind of person I wanted to be at all, all. Story 18. I wouldn't have classified myself as, but I definitely had some ideas about Native people in my city growing up. There are a lot of Native addicts and vagrants, but it's very much a result of a system that's rigged against those communities. I didn't know any of that growing up, so when I saw a group of drunk Native people in the park or something, I was generally unimpressed or even frightened. And I definitely applied those feelings to all the Native people I came across. It's hard to change those reactions, but we can all identify the bad reactions and try to curb them. Story 19. Throwaways are for cats. Grandfather on one side would drop jokes with hard R's. Grandmother on that side would talk about how, whisper, Mexicans were ruining South Dakota long before complaining about illegal immigration was mainstream. Father wasn't nearly that far gone, but after one failed relationship with a Chinese woman, he encouraged me to marry a white woman and my mother once vehemently objected to my sister having an openly boy man as a roommate. So where did it all go wrong? 
Basically, I traveled to different places and met different people. The town where I grew up had a pretty large Indian population, and I had an Indian best friend growing up. He was also a bit at the time, frankly. Went away to Boston for a summer, and through some random set of circumstances, found myself going to a church for the summer. They were just like the white church I had been going to. One kid wanted to grow up to be a programmer just like I wanted to at the time, etc., etc. Went off to California for school and was exposed to a wide variety of people. Hispanic roommate and Hispanic RA freshman year, one was an unpleasant person. One became a good friend, and I realized it had nothing to do with their ethnicity. Made a good friend sophomore year, and he later came out to me, and either I wronged the whole time about Josh, or I was wrong about whatever leftover prejudices I had about boy people. Now I'm married to another Chinese woman. One of my best friends is, another is boy. One of my daughter's best friends is Hispanic, and I'm still here in the bluest part of CA. There was no liberal indoctrination in college like conservatives are always complaining about. There was just meeting people and realizing that whatever reasons I had for disliking them or distrusting them from the beginning were false. Story 20. I'm not A, but I did change a guy's mind at a bar once. At least, I'd like to hope I did. He was ranting on about minorities causing problems in America, using all kinds of racial slurs. The bartender repeatedly asked him to stop. I happened to be sitting next to him at the bar. I'm a non-confrontational person, so I just kind of ignored his ramblings and watched the TV. There was a football game on, I believe. He turned to me and said something along the lines of, Can you believe this, BH? When the bartender told him he needed to shut his mouth or leave. Then I became a part of it. I told him that his words were not appropriate and offensive to me. He asked me why does that matter to me as a fellow white guy. Full disclosure, I'm a first-generation American. My father is from Mexico. But I'm very light-skinned, and so I do look 100% white. I informed him of this as well as the fact that my niece is, and his tone completely changed. He started calling me a SCWK, you name it. Told me he wanted to go outside and beat my A in the parking lot. All because I informed him of my heritage. I spent the next 20-ish minutes trying to show him how flawed his logic was. How he was fine standing next to me, spewing nonsense, and even looked for me to back him up until he found out that I wasn't really white. We talked for a while before the bartender eventually threw him out. While I'm not sure if his mind was totally changed, he did offer an apology for what he said, and for judging me and calling me names. He also ended up buying me a drink as well. I'd like to think that he's changed for the better, but I never saw him at that bar again. I always wonder how people can just snap like that over skin color risk when the guy had no problem with me as a person when he thought I was just white. Story 21. As a child, I remember not liking other children who weren't white. It wasn't taught by my parents. They were always accepting of everyone. Still not sure what was the root of it. If I had to guess, it was either television or just ignorance. But before seventh grade, I met a kid at my summer camp and we instantly became best friends. I think pretty much overnight changed my mind on the matter. He taught me so much about culture, and it really changed my point of view. We're still best buds 17 years later. Story 22. As a young kid, being raised by my old school grandparents who still called people neos and looked down upon native people, I thought that was normal as a kid. One day for a school field trip, though, we went to a native reserve, went to a giant log house and watched a traditional native ceremony of some sort. It was actually really interesting to see in person and made me realize that they weren't all drunks and gang members as my grandparents had portrayed them to be. This experience made me think different about all, and I one day confronted my grandparents on it. They stopped using the N-word after that, so I hope I made some impression on them. Nowadays, racism makes me cringe. I hate it. As a white guy, I've only ever experienced against me a handful of times. But those few times made me appreciate the much worse things many others go through simply because they are born a certain color. Story 23. Parents were old white people so they'd make Chinaman jokes, uh, or complain about bad Asian drivers. Nothing obscene but still. Growing up kids my age were bigots who bullied everything they could. This was the real tragedy. I think kids these days are less LK they were in my day. Tool me a few years to adjust to today's views. And still not entirely there despite being liberal in a lot of ways. Story 24. I see race as a non-scientific category, however. I was raised to mistrust European-American. My parents, African-American, all of my neighbors and family friends suffered deeply from the racism. 1960s, Los Angeles Ka. I was in my late 30s before I had my first intercultural friendship. That friendship did not survive because of extremely different views about pets. I have pet allergies. But I came from that friendship understanding that she was kind, fair, and knew how to be a great friend. That first intercultural friendship left me open to develop what has become my dearest friend, Stacy. We can talk about anything and maintain respect or set it aside and come back to it if it's a hot topic. We have made each other laugh to tears too many times to count. We trust each other. 
The internal work that my intercultural friendships demanded improved every friendship in my life, including mine with family members. As I have aged and enjoyed friendships with many different cultures and ethnic groups, my heart has opened to accept and extend kindness to all human beings. Something I have also come to understand is that European American immigrants were also deeply damaged by African enslavement and European American immigrant supremacist ideologies that are heavily woven into American culture. Untangling this damage will take time and much forgiveness, but I'm hopeful and I know that it will be very much worth the effort as we move forward. Story 25 I was not raised by parents, but you can't help growing up with messages all around society and tending to believe some of them. I had ideas about indigenous people, Muslim people, all sorts of poisonous ideas. When I got into my early 20s, I started to make good money and began traveling, and all of my notions disappeared with that. Nothing made me realize how similar human beings are regardless of race than traveling. Story 26 I was in college and I thought racism was solved. I said that to a girl in my major, and she just turned to me and said, No, it's not. You just don't see it, or something to that effect. I guess I was well on my way to not being anymore by that point, just by getting away from my tiny town I grew up in. But the amount of embarrassment I had in that moment as a 20-year-old kid, I will never forget it as long as I live. To me, if someone who is tells you racism isn't solved and still exists, you do a double take and take stock of your viewpoint. It's been a gradual process over 10 years for me to recognize the implicit bias and views society has taught me but I try really hard to recognize it now and check myself. Edit. My mother used the phrase once that all the blacks made the area dangerous that we were in. That's when I realized I was raised in a household that had casually views and didn't even recognize it. Story 27. I never thought I was until I started going to the bars. If a white dude was hitting on me, I'd usually accept a drink and politely turn him down or not later that night. If a man did the same, I got really uncomfortable and would just ignore them completely. As a young white girl, I was taught that men were dangerous close relationship predators. This is something I carried into my adult life. One night, among many nights where I went out with my friends, it randomly occurred to me that I reacted to men immensely different than white men for doing the same exact thing. I didn't know why, but I decided that night that I wasn't going to do that anymore. It led me to realize many other odd things I did in my day-to-day -day life without even realizing I was doing them. Story 28. When I was in kindergarten, I had a crush on a friend of mine who was my parents would tell me to be careful around him and not to get attached B.C. He would probably grow up to be a criminal because he was. I remember being confused. B.C. nothing seemed to justify that. Even stranger is that thinking back on it. He never looked down on anybody for it per se. It was more like a fact. Like, I respect you, but it sucks. This is all you'll ever amount to. His reasoning from statistics he found or something IDK. My dad loved his dad though and I think called him an exception. His dad was the gym teacher at the middle school my dad wanted me to attend. Anyway, he'd said this often enough and repeated the jail statistic that I was wary of most, specifically, men I'd see by the age of eight for no good reason. Years later, I was maybe 13 and I checked in with the same kid from kindergarten, and he was the same super sweet kid I remembered, and I realized I didn't feel any different about him. I was never scared of him and honestly thought if anyone was going to grow up to be a super successful guy, it would be him. Another thing my dad told me was that he would be stuck below the poverty line, a yucky thing to say. It sucked to realize I'd seen every man I encountered as a criminal or future criminal, and my friend was the exception. It still really sucks to think I'd been gripped by that mindset. Anyway, it took a bit to let go of the irrational fear, but by that point I knew it was irrational which made it so much easier. On a lighter note, when I first met him, I immediately assumed everybody was made of chocolate. For instance, I was white chocolate and TBH I was jealous at first BC. I liked milk and dark chocolate better, and assumed he got the better end of the bargain. He is also still a super snazzy guy. Story 29. I don't think I was ever really, but I subconsciously would think that way. I have to stop and remind myself every now and then that I shouldn't think like that. I never thought I don't want to be friends with him because he's, but I would put people of different colors into stereotypes. I'm still struggling with it, but I never make decisions based on it. I don't know if I can ever train myself to not think like that, but I have trained myself to notice when I'm doing it and correct myself. Story 30. I didn't know I was at first. It was a gradual transition for me that lasted into last year. I was raised in sort of strange captivity. Homeschool since the beginning of fourth grade. Live on a farm a 20-minute drive from town. No kids my age around me. Self-righteous Christian parents. Truck driver dad, only home on weekends. A stay-at-home mom with an archaic, strict ideology of the child obeys the parent unquestionably. Brother and sister 10-plus years older and gone when I started to grow up. There is no conclusion to my life, so strap in. My first clear memory of, wait, this isn't right. I was around my early teen years, and we were headed to town for something, possibly church. 
We were just down the road from our house when going last our neighbor's driveway. We noticed a young woman sitting at the end of the drive next to the trash. Right where she belongs, my mother said jokingly. That's never sat well with me. When my mind went to, I hope she is okay, my mother went to, right where she belongs. There was a very strong justification from my mother my entire life that, you don't have to be to be an eye, it's the same thing as white trash. I largely accepted this my entire life. Made sense to me. My mother was a strong, educated, had a degree in English, Christian woman, and it was not my place to question her. I grew up with talks of politics, crime, statistics, etc. I had everything to justify that what we thought wasn't it was true, and we had the statistics to back it up. It wasn't truthfully until I was like early 20s that I met an older woman named Valerie. She was an ASL professor at the local community college and a woman from San Francisco that moved here to teach with her two daughters. I was there to tend her lawn every week, but she was new to the area and enjoyed my company after I was done. In my firm and humbled opinion, she is the very reason I am who I am today. She taught me what white privilege really meant. Not that my life is inherently easy, just that none of my struggles stem from the color of my skin. Paraphrasing strongly here, she sat with me, sometimes for hours, every time I came there and just talked to me about things and what I felt and thought. She never judged me, never got mad. She just genuinely talked to me about racism and being in America, the things she had faced, and also her job and career as well as teaching me a lot about the deaf community. Now I was no fool. I never thought, white people are better than people, protect our race. It was more, people are cool, but they commit a lot of crime. But I always held the moral idea that we all bleed the same. Yes, I was very at odds with myself over everything. Wait until you hear the story of how I became an atheist after being a leader in our church. But this all culminated last year, in the height of the George Floyd protests. It was June 19th, 2020, approximately 10.30 a.m. I had woken up at 9.30 and chilled in bed reading Facebook for a while. Seeing all the protests going on, the movement our country was making for human rights was a good thing. Made me happy. I decided today will be a good day. That's when I got up to go see what mom was doing. Our relationship had been doing well the last few days. After a rough few years of things going south, I had finally gotten a new career that paid well and would finally be able to get out and stand on my own after having tried several times over the last 26 years. I walked into the living room and there's mom in her chair on her phone, probably reading Facebook or some homesteading blog. Me. Good morning, mother. What are you up to, mom? Oh, watching these knee burn the me underscore shut the fudge up. It just flew out of me in the biggest rage I have ever felt. I had no idea what just happened. First time in my life I've ever said that to my mother. What ensued was a mass V fight between her and I. At one point, she told me I couldn't see straight because have my head shoved so far up at N-Words Peach and that my heart is so full of hate. The result? I had packed everything I owned into my Kia and left. When I left, she was on the phone with my dad talking to him. The last thing I ever said to my mother was, if their niece, I'm a nigh too bad person. The last thing I heard her say about me to my father? Maybe he needs to suffer so he'll learn. I got in my car, got a hotel room for the weekend in town. I blocked my mother's number when I left. My father hadn't tried to contact me, so I blocked him too for being a coward and a piece of cow. When my sister saw what I had posted on my Snapchat story about it, she didn't try to contact me either, so I blocked her too. Monday came. I got my own phone plan and a new phone number, blocked my entire family on Facebook, and have not had any contact with a single person in my family save my brother. It's been almost a year now. I live in my Kia, still doing the same job and traveling for a living. Been trying to buy a van, but been having a lot of trouble getting everything switched over to Tennessee from Illinois. Not having an apartment or bills makes it hard lol. My brother has relayed the random hi from my mom, but my dad has only asked about me once since, how's drop doing? That's it. I don't regret it one single flipping bit. My life growing up was hell, and I did not realize until I got out how wildly abusive my family was, and how abused I was. I'm 27 now and I feel like my entire life has been a lie. For years, I have held the belief that, when presented with the opportunity, we as people have a moral obligation to do good. I choose to believe in humanity as a whole. I may not have any family anymore, but at least I've got my flipping morality. Yay. Before anyone asks why I was 26 living with my family, I had tried multiple times to move out. By every attempt to do anything adult was thwarted by my mother. She has flattened my tires before to keep me from getting to work. Trust me, I never wanted to be there, ever. That's why I say I was kept in captivity, especially when I was younger, I had nowhere to go, I was trapped. ETA conclusion and looking back. It was June 19th, 2020. I decided today will be a good day. It was a good day. It was the day I finally started living my life. It wasn't until a few months ago when I sort of came to terms with the fact that I was severely abused and had no idea. 
I was so thoroughly indoctrinated that I normalized everything. I want to be clear, my parents never really beat me. My mother would tell me all the time that I was a screw-up, that she didn't want to talk to me, couldn't look at me, etc. Once when I was younger, she locked me out of the house in the middle of winter and over a foot of snow for hours, told me that I had demons oppressing me, spirits on me, etc., all while telling me how much she loves me and calling me her baby boy. As far as the suffering my mom said I needed to do, well, I've been pretty god oh no good all things considered. I travel for a living making a pretty decent sum. So if any of you want to breathe and hear some other crazy cow about my life, let me know. I'll swing by for a bit, Lumfow. I have a few thousand and growing in my crypto account, and I'm starting my savings to buy my first house hopefully in a couple years so I can start getting into real estate and eventually into stocks. I do indeed still live out of my car and occasionally hotel rooms when I feel like spending the money. It's not that I can't afford a place, I just don't want to. I'm trying to get a Ford Transit to live out of for a while, but I still owe 17k on my car. I'd say I'm doing pretty flipping well. I've learned a lot too, mainly that my mother was a psycho bad person. And I'm not a fudge up, I'm actually intelligent as cow, and she's been holding me back my whole life. I don't hate my parents, I actually don't genuinely care about them at all. They will likely pass away alone, and that's entirely their fault. Part of me pities them, honestly. After having a deep interpersonal struggle between my own moral beliefs and how my parents were raising me, I'm just glad to finally be able to figure out who I really am. My life has been and still is a roller coaster, but I'm flipping living it. Story 31. My immediate family was, we're not racists, but, and my extended family was outright trailer trash. I was raised to kind of believe, we're not, just superior. In my teen years, the hypocrisy of it really started becoming apparent. Certain people were the way they were because it was just inherent of their culture. Ours were the way they were because they were unlucky, didn't have the same opportunities, and it was understandable that they'd feel the urge for escapism or lashing out. Lol. My feelings on the subject really grew when I had kids of my own, and I just started thinking about how flipping random life dictating details are. Where you're born, what color you are, your gender, close relationship identity, and how I did nothing to make my kids white and male in the southern U.S. Life just happened that way. And then I started thinking, what if they weren't? What if they face the same everyday nonsense that millions of other people in this country do? What if I had to live with the real fear that they'd be walking to the bodega one day for an Arizona and some Skittles and were disappeared by flipping cops? And I taught my kids to think more than I was raised to. Story 32. I used to hate white people like a lot for no reason. I would always think they were evil and monsters. I was absolutely disgusted when I went to school and saw people hanging out with white people until I realized the beauty and how they didn't care about the color of each other's skin. I felt so ashamed of judging someone because of their race. Now I treat white people the same as everyone else. Story 33. My grandfather was incredibly kicked his daughter out of the house for falling in love with my father, a man. He assumed if he her off, she'd be desperate enough for food and shelter to ditch my father. Didn't work out that way. But of course, that changed when my older sister was born. Because hatred is powerful, but something is more powerful. Not love. Ribs. My father cooked ribs to celebrate the birth of my sister. And my grandfather, who had been browbeaten by my grandmother into visiting to meet his granddaughter, smelled the ribs. And he wanted to try them. Apparently, he declared, if these end can cook like this, maybe they're worth a oh no. So it became a ritual. He started coming over twice a month to eat dad's ribs and in the process was exposed to more and more people. He ended up apologizing and came round, all due to the power of ribs. Story 34. I don't think I was, but I do think I was a part of the problem. I didn't understand racism and thereby passively condoned it. For example, I was convinced that men being terminated by the police was really a police reform issue and not a systemic racism issue. This is, looking back, the most dangerous type of racism. What changed was the George Floyd murder video. As a white man, I've been mistreated by police, but I have never, ever, ever felt like, you know, they just might terminate me. And that is, in summary, my idea of white privilege really is in America. That someone could be terminated on video in broad daylight with witnesses begging for his life, and the police felt confident it would work out just fine, is systemic, overarching racism that flows through the heart of this country. Passively condoning that is still racism. Story 35. Not really a learning the error of his ways, but a turning point about race in a family member's life. My grandfather grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and when he was a kid in the late 30s, he and a friend of his were playing by a river, and the friend fell in and started drowning. My grandfather couldn't swim, so he ran to the road to get help. Cars kept passing by and not stopping for a young boy crying for help, until finally a car pulled over. It was a young couple, and the man jumped in to save my grandfather's friend. 
they were able to pull him out, but unfortunately the friend passed away. My grandfather told me that is why he doesn't think any race is inferior or superior. Because this young couple were the only ones to pull over and help a young white boy crying for help. Story 36. I wasn't the sort of that you think of when you think, but I did do things that were driven by negative racial stereotypes. Mostly the idea that racialized people are somehow fundamentally different from me. For example, I never watched TV shows with predominantly casts because I assumed I wasn't like them and wouldn't enjoy or understand the show. I assumed their lives and experience must be so different than mine that I wouldn't get the show. I don't really know where the idea came from, to be honest. Maybe just the world's tendency to turn people who look different into others. I grew up in a small town with literally two non-white families. And that attitude of racialized people being different was pretty prevalent in subtle and overt ways. It was just a matter of getting older and recognizing that racism in myself. I learned to notice when I was subtly shying away from something and understand that, A, it's super poor to assume that I don't have anything in common with someone because their race or culture is different than mine, and B, distancing myself from them is a poor solution to my poor assumptions. Story 37. I grew up! As a child, I lived in the southern U.S. and my parents, and the whole society, was. The only people I came in contact with were maids, gardeners, janitors. Schools were segregated. The only Asians I knew owned Chinese restaurants, and we didn't socialize with them. As a child, I figured that adults must know something about these people that I didn't know because they seemed okay to me. When I grew up, married, and left the South, it was holy cow. WTF had I been living with? So when I read about parents producing kids, I think, not necessarily, story 38, I honestly used to be kind of against, like, fresh off of the boat Asians when I was younger. I don't even remember why. I think I just had some weird run-ins and they had really poor English and I was an idiot. Anyways, I remember I had just gotten gas and was back in my truck ready to leave when I heard an Asian man calling to me with bad English, trying to get my attention. I rolled my eyes out of the back of my skull, rolled down the window and snapped, what? In broken English, he told me I'd forgotten to put my gas cap back on. Took a breath and realized how much of an unpleasant person I was just about to be to this guy for absolutely no reason. Completely changed my perspective. And nowadays, from other life experiences, I have such respect for first-generation immigrants who have been able to learn English, even if they speak it poorly. But yeah, I was a banana for a bit. Story 39. Not an ex. Actually, I'm a Noah Cod YouTuber named Drift0R. Been watching him since the Modern Warfare two days, and he's very open on the fact that he used to be on some cow as a kid. But like any ex, his worldview opened up and you can see the difference, because he even brought his own evidence of it. At first, I thought it had turned me off from his content, but he clearly regrets it first off. Second off, he's an example that people are redeemable from past perspectives as long as they find themselves in headspace and time where they begin to see the world for what it really is or supposed to be.